back on the Zero Hour. As always, I'm your host, Richard R.J. Escal. And joining us once again for a report on the world of labor organizing is our great friend, Mike Elk. Mike is the publisher and editor of Payday Report, uh, which in my book is uh, one of the best uh, journals out there for following what's going on in labor. Uh, if you don't read it, and if you don't pay to read it, you should. It's paydayreport.org, right, Mike? I always get that re- wrong. Paydayreport.com. Yeah, I mean, I have it open all the time, so I never have to go to the URL. And uh, and he joins us again for an update on the world of labor organizing. So first of all, Mike, welcome back to the program. Uh, thanks for having me back, Richard. Secondly, I notice. I mean, we'll talk about you know a number of major stories right now, but a couple of them I notice have to do with healthcare. So why don't we start with that? Maybe with what's going on with uh, uh, abortion demand in uh, Western Pennsylvania. Well, we've seen in Western PA uh, a huge spike, uh, a doubling in the demand for abortion uh, since the Dobbs decision was handed down. Um, you know, Western PA is less than an hour from the border with both West Virginia and Ohio, uh, and in both states effectively banned abortion, as well as Kentucky isn't that far either. Uh, so a lot of people seeking abortion suddenly uh, had to come to Pittsburgh as the closest place to find one. Uh, there's not really many other places. Uh, there's only a, a few places uh, in Western PA that you, you can even get abortions anymore. Uh, people that come you know, down from Erie to get them because uh, there's nowhere up there anymore to get them. Uh, and so, you know, we've seen a huge influx of people. Uh, and at the same time, you know, Planned Parenthood, is one of those massive nonprofits that's almost a corporation, if that makes much sense. Sure. Uh, they operate like a corporation. Uh, they bring in you know, hundreds of millions, uh, if not billions of dollars every year. Uh, they're a massive nonprofit complex with individual state affiliates scattered throughout the nation. Um, and so we're going to, uh, you know, we've been looking a lot into this. Uh, because, uh, you know, uh, providing abortion access it really depends upon how many workers you have. And the other day I was at a rally. Uh, some women were joining Unite Electrical Workers 696 here. Um, it's uh, about 120 uh, folks. Um, most of them are healthcare assistants and administrative workers. Uh, and one of the scariest things to hear was the call center workers, right? All these people call for appointments uh, when they want to get an abortion. Um, all these people uh, call for appointments uh, and all that other kind of stuff. And, um, you know, all the time. And, you know, they were saying on the day that the Dobbs decision came down that there was only one person uh, in the call center. And so people had to volunteer to come in and help out uh, because there were so many people calling from Ohio and West Virginia who had had their abortions uh, canceled. Uh, so we're seeing a huge spike in demand at Planned Parenthood here in Western PA. But at the same time, uh, they're paying so low wages and there's so much understaffing uh, that they can't meet the demand. Uh, you know, you're looking at call center workers that are making $16.50 an hour. You know, I was talking to folks who said they had to sell their plasma to get by, that, um, you know, went on food stamps to get by. It's a very uh, difficult uh, situation. Uh, and at the same time, uh, you know, folks, there's, there's, you know, there's, um, within, you know, Planned Parenthood recruits a lot of young, uh, idealistic folks, uh, that want to help make abortions, uh, per- accessible to lots of folks. And that makes them easy to exploit, um, because they'll get folks that are there for the mission, uh, that are willing to put up with the low wages. And if you look at what's happening right now across the country, uh, you know, Planned Parenthood is on a fundraising bonanza, uh, and they could afford to pay these folks more. They could afford to create more sustainability. Uh, and one person, you know, stood up and said at this rally the other day that, you know, the leadership of Planned Parenthood is as much of a threat to abortion rights as the state legislatures in some of these GOP areas, as the Supreme Court, uh, because they're not providing enough services. Uh, and at the same time, we've seen uh, you know, they've been trying to negotiate a union contract here for 14 months. It's a really long time to negotiate a union contract if you're trying in good faith. Um, 
we've seen in uh, Massachusetts uh, that abortion workers there, uh, when they tried to organize, uh, management told them not to, that it could hurt them in this era of Roe and Dobbs. Um, and, you know, we saw uh, the, the Guttenmaker Institute, uh, you know, they fired an organizer. So you're seeing these huge uh, corporation-like nonprofits uh, fight back against this organizing. And a lot of these groups are headed by folks that claim to be progressives. Well, and, you know, when you talk about the emotional burden that these workers carry, Mike, uh, you, you quote somebody, you quote one such worker as saying, her name is Tara Crow, you quote her as saying, I hold their hand, meaning the patients, I hold their hair back while they vomit, I, I tell them you are not alone, I go to the patient and I repeat a similar process, myself and my co-workers do this sometimes up to 20 times a day, you know, the stress, just unbelievable, I've always been of the view that uh, you know, if if you don't support union organizing, you're not truly progressive. So, uh, are these workers? They're they're not. Uh, you, it sounds pretty clear that they're not getting support from their organization in their union efforts. Uh, I, yeah, I mean, they're not. Yeah, they're not getting support from the the organization in their union efforts. People are very upset about this. And it's something that I think our movement has a hard time grappling with. Um, and I think, you know, it was interesting to think about uh, a month or two ago, I was at a screening of the movie Jane, um, which was about uh, uh, an abortion service uh, in the 60s, where women were training other women that weren't necessarily medical workers to give abortions. And in the movie Jane, you know, you, you think about, you know, when these kind of services first started, they were very anarchistic services. And now they've grown into these huge nonprofits where you have these leaders that, that don't have the best interest of workers at heart all the time. Right. And, and you know, uh, obviously, uh, it, it should go without saying that the leadership of that Planned Parenthood as, as an organization does a lot of great work. I don't think anybody's questioning that, uh, both in terms of abortion services and other health services. That's not the question, but uh, the difference between people, you know, let's say who are economically comfortable, uh, uh, who are providing volunteer services as, as a form of charity, as an option, uh, that's one thing. But if you're asking working people who need to survive, uh, you can't ask them to make sacrifices uh, in the working class in this economy right now. That's two separate things. And uh, I think you can both be progressive and support the work of Planned Parenthood and support the right of workers in this field to make a, to organize for themselves and make a living wage. And to me, that's the point of uh, your excellent reporting in this area. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, and I think, you know, we see this across the board in the nonprofit space. Certainly, as people who spent our career in nonprofit journalism, we've seen a lot of exploitation. Sure. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, people have basic needs. And if you can't meet your basic needs, how can you help meet the needs of others? Right. And this to me is, you know, you're right about the nonprofit space. And it goes back to the discussions which I think have largely gone our way since then about, you know, there was a time when a lot of nonprofits were using unpaid interns and, you know, there've been a number of labor issues that we've had to struggle through. And the fact is people in every field deserve a living wage. This is a fight for this on this fight. Uh, what's the next, what's the current status, Mike? And what's the, what do you, what's well, next? There's contract negotiations now. Uh, there was a big rally the other day. Maybe that would apply some pressure. Uh, the mayor of Pittsburgh showed up to the rally. Uh, and I think what he said was interesting was that, you know, and I think the mayor of Pittsburgh, Ed Ganey, he's a black mayor. He's progressive. He just took power this year. Ganey said that this fight just wasn't important for Planned Parenthood workers, but it was important to teach us as a movement in the city about our values, who we are. And I think that's important. And I, I don't think often enough that we think of organizing in that context of, you know, we learn from each other, right? Uh, right. Think of it that way. We think of it uh, often as, you know, we're helping someone. Uh, but, you know, I, I come out of the Paulo Freire school of these kind of things. Paulo Freire was a Brazilian 
uh, sociologist and his big claim to fame was that he could teach people um, he could teach people how to um, he could teach people how to read in uh, 30 days um, and you know I mean, well, there was like 90 days and what it was is he was taking people out in the field and they were learning from each other and I think constantly in organizing we have to think about it that way that we're always learning from each other that you have to be able to teach something and you have to be able to learn something uh, and that, you know, too often it's become a one-way street. Well, absolutely. And I also believe, and I, I know you do too, that every successful act, and sometimes unsuccessful ones too, of organizing shows people that they have more power than they realize. And that to me is another form of teaching each other. Um, but as long as we're on the topic of healthcare, you also covered, uh, I wrote about, uh, a new sort of fledgling uh, independent pharmacist union that was uh, organizing a walkout and uh, or maybe had organized a walkout and was also uh, organizing some action in Southern California. What's that about? Well, so these are the two different units. There's a fledgling independent oh, okay. pharmacist union that last December organized a walkout nationwide and has been trying to organize folks nationwide. Uh, and then um, there's the UFCW local Southern California represent about 600 pharmacists at the, at the grocery stores there. Uh, and they just voted to strike. Uh, pharmacists have been on the front lines of the pandemic uh, and they've been getting abused and abused and abused with the more consolidation. I mean, a pharmacist used to be able to really help people, used to be able to really talk to people about their medication, spend time with people. And, you know, they, a lot of them were working in these independent stores and someday they might be partners. But now we've seen this huge consolidation of all these big chains, CVS and uh, Walgreens. And, and, you know, a lot of them also own uh, right. healthcare firms. Uh, a lot of them have clinics. Uh, and we're seeing less and less workers there and less and less pay. I mean, you're seeing people coming out of college, a pharmacy school, 200K in debt, making 40K a year. Uh, and there's no way they're going to be able to survive on it. Right. You know. Yeah, no, absolutely. I have a friend who's a pharmacist who uh, uh, broke away from that system is trying to run an independent pharmacy along ethical lines. And we become good friends. And uh, uh, by the way, he said to me, do you know this guy, David Doyen? And I, I, he met David Dayen from the prospect who we both know and i said yeah he's a good friend of mine you know he's edited some pieces for me and he's been on my show a few times he's a hero he said you know because of uh, what he's written these guys whether they're independent or whether they're working for one of the big chains they're being squeezed right and left like you say they come out of college with huge debt they make very little and they're frontline health workers they are you know, they're professionals, they're, ex, you know, they make life and death decisions. If they make a mistake, it can kill somebody. Um, so they're really being mistreated. So what's this, and they deserve a union. What's the status of these organizing efforts? Well, I think the status is, oh, sorry. Uh, they're Wake up, Mike. Wake up. Okay. Sorry, I was up late, buddy. All right. There's a lot of ongoing organizing. Um, uh, and, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on right now uh, with the organizing uh, across the country, and I think it's picking up. Uh, there's been a lot of viral momentum, um, and I think we're seeing a similar pattern to what we saw during the teacher strikes, which is that people are organizing through social media. They're horizontally organizing, right? Uh, they're not waiting for big organizations to come around and do it anymore. Obviously, right. independent fledgling unions do this puts pressure on the more established unions. I mean, certainly we saw this at Amazon and other places to do more because if these guys with no resources can organize stuff, why can't the unions with big resources do stuff? And I think too right. often we're all a little too cautious. You know, I think, I think, you know, the other day I was talking to someone and they were saying, well, how, how do I organize? I don't have a plan to do it with these folks. And I, I said, look, you just got to organize and you guys have to develop a plan, you know? You just have to do it. I think too often, you know, I think paralysis comes in organizing. I think people think about not doing stuff. I mean, it reminds me of what you taught me when I was about 23. 
more than a decade ago about writing, which is that once you stop, the moment, the lack of the momentum kills you. Right. <laughs> and I right. mean, we get into these places where organizing uh, organizers become debating committees. Oh, we need this approach. We need that approach. And, uh, the truth is there is no one approach. You know, uh, there's nothing I hate more as a labor reporter than when a publication calls me up and asks me to write a piece on how do we save the labor movement. I don't think there's any one answer. <laughs> right, right. I think the biggest answer is that we, we have to be not afraid to improvise, that we have to be not afraid to be creative, we have to be uh, not tied to tactics because we get tied into so much cautiousness uh, that we don't do anything, uh, that, that there's no momentum. That uh, I remember organizing the News Guild was trying to talking not really about organizing freelance writers in the early 2010s. And I would go to these meetings and the meetings would be about having more meetings to potentially talk about how we develop a plan. And it's like, well, let's just fucking do something, you know? Right. Right. You know, and every work situation is different, right? So there's no formula. I mean, uh, pharmacists, speaking of formulas, formula pharmacists who work at the supermarket chains are in a different situation than Amazon workers in a in uh, in large uh, shipment centers, and uh, you know, and so on and so on and so on. So you can't just say there's one. It's like, hey, we work in this place here, and we know what our situations are. We know what where the weak spots for our bosses' businesses are, we know the pressure points are. So beyond a certain point, it's, listen, uh, we know what we need. We need more pay. We need better benefits. We need predictable hours so we can reach childcare, whatever it may be, there's, you know, you know, a whole set of issues. So, you know, we draw up a list of demands. We say, if you don't do this, this, and this, we're going to do that, that, and that. And then you do it, you know, maybe you need some advice on certain things and, you know, hopefully we'll do more and more to build up a bank of people you can call. But essentially, you're right. You know, you take the power. You don't wait for somebody to um, to give it to you. You know, one of, one of my and then I'll stop talking. But one of the favorite things of uh, I heard somebody of my generation say was at one of these like conferences, Somebody said uh, to someone of roughly my age, um, when is your generation going to step aside and let my generation take over? And he said, come get it. He said, you know, we didn't like ask anybody's permission to do what we did. And we don't expect you to ask ours. Go in and take over. Push us out of the way. Nothing would make us happier. And that's the way you do things. You go and you do it. Do you get what I'm driving at? Oh, I get totally what you're driving at. I mean, I think, you know, Bill Greider wrote about this right after the 2017 election, I mean, 2016 election, which is that people learn a language and they learn it as they're growing. I, I was thinking of Bill the other day. Um, there was this 22-year-old kid outside of Louisville and, you know, Bill worked in Louisville for years and he was trying to organize an Amazon facility. And I interviewed him. And he's, I mean, he's, he's got a kid, too. So he's really putting his neck out there. I interviewed him. And he was saying, you know, I didn't know anything about organizing. Then I started watching the, the Bessemer Union Drive and Alabama at Amazon. Uh, and then I started reading and going to seminars. And I started having a little committee forming, having meetings. Uh, and then, you know, I watched uh, what happened uh, in um uh, in, with the Staten Island victory, and I decided to start organizing. I thought it was tremendously bold that a guy who was 22 year old with a kid would just go out and experiment. But that's the only way we get democracy. I mean, look, that's always been, I mean, look at SNCC, look at the tactics they used in the South. And, you know, I'm actually working on a series of stories right now about this, about intergenerational organizing. And I think our, our generation, I'm 36 uh, and, and below, uh, has a lot to learn uh, from sort of your generation you know, the 60s and the 70s generation who really, you know, were really bold. Uh, and I think a lot of lessons. And I think the one thing that not everybody in my generation picks up on, but enough people pick up on is the one lesson of the new left was not to denounce your parents. <laughs> right. Generation. 
I mean, that was a, a sort of an error in some ways, the new left in that sense. Right. It was. It absolutely was. I mean, in our case, we started learning amazing things about our parents like years later, you know, that we didn't even know. You know, first of all, my mother became this amazing activist. My father had this like history that nobody knew about of of uh, of activism. And, you know, it uh, and I only knew him as this annoying, you know, dad. You know, so th there's so much out there that to learn from from previous generations. Yeah, I totally agree with that. You know, yeah. <coughs> And so I, I think we're in a position where, you know, I, I think we're at a really exciting moment. And, and I think the one thing we have to, you know, because I read all these plans and, and I really disagree, you know, Stephen Greenhouse and Harold Myerson wrote this piece that the unions have to sit down and carve up turf. No, they don't. <laughs> I actually think carving up turf is a really bad idea. Uh, you know, and this is what happens when the union says, oh, well, these workers are our territory without organizing any workers. Workers should right. have a choice of units, right? They should be able to choose different ones. If we had sat down and carved up turf on Amazon, we never would have wanted Staten Island. Right, right, right. No, I, I couldn't agree with you more, Mike. I, I feel like part of the win of Staten Island, Amazon was was first of all because it was grassroots and because it was cultural because there was music happening at the tent because you know you could come and hang and have coffee and you know it was social and cultural as well as organizing and economic and that's something that if you brought in the leadership of some national organization they wouldn't have gotten that you know and that's not if you brought in somebody of my generation that's not a knock on my generation when we did our stuff back in the 70s or 60s you know our parents wouldn't have gotten what we were doing either you know i mean that that's the part where generations can learn from each other but generations also have to the older generations also have to learn from the younger ones you know my generation has a lot to learn from somebody like chris smalls because we don't have the life experience that your generation does and we have to learn that also it's two-way oh yeah i mean you, i mean I, I don't mean to knock your generation but you guys didn't have the student debt. You guys didn't have the right. gig economy employment. Right. Uh, you know, people could be hippies and go get a job at a factory and organize it. You know. Or oh, I, I told you about that, huh? Yeah, I mean, I, I actually, you know, I mean, you could be a hippie and then go get a job whenever you wanted. You know, you could work in a store, you could work in, I did work in a factory, I worked in laundry, I worked in this and that. There was always a job there, you know, if you didn't mind working, you know, some people from certain classes didn't want manual labor. I always did manual labor, so I, there was always work when I wanted work. And uh, I did know people who went into factories and organized and, you know, when they were like one friend from high school, when she was done with that, she, you know, went to college and became like a psychologist or something and without student debt, you know, I mean, that was the option we had. So uh, believe me, you know, I mean, one of the big, uh, one of the things that unifies the causes I work on now is the ways in which, people younger than my generation got screwed that we didn't. And that's something that my generation should be conscious of. Not that I blame my generation for it, because I think blaming generations distracts from class warfare. But we should certainly know about it, and we should certainly care about it. And we should also know that like, maybe we were turned on by singing like Woody Guthrie songs and Bob Dylan songs at a rally, but you know what got people drawn into the tent at the Amazon organizing at Staten Island was not the music that drew us into the tent, and that's okay. You know, we got to. It's all part of the flow, part of the process, and part of the give and take. Speaking of rallies, I want to bring this point up quickly. Yeah, I didn't include this in my story on the abortion workers rally. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the rally. I didn't want to include this in my story because I thought it could go in some weird directions. At the end of the rally, uh, these workers brought forward a pinata shaped like a uterus and a small child came and beat up the pinata. <laughs> a child beat up, what? The child beat up the uterus? Uh, pinata? 
Okay, all right. Yeah, it could have come oh, across I weird. Candy. <laughs> I didn't want to include it in the story because I thought it would distract. Yeah, no, that's culturally like a tough one to convey. It, <laughs> yeah. Everybody was having a lot of fun. And it was like one of those things where like one of my friends who was a PR person was like, this is really terrible uh, that they would uh, that they would do this. Um, well, you they, noticed then when you told this the messaging, but but you know what it was was that these women who were all trying to deal with really stressful situations had dark humor. I just thought it would no. be really funny to, to beat up a pinata, and the women who worked at the abortion clinic were going nuts, and they were clapping, and, and you know everybody was laughing at the end of this really solemn rally. And that's something that I think your average union wouldn't do, but the women there just thought it was fun, and it was actually kind of a nice way to end the rally, you know. And there was no, I, I totally understand why it worked, and I totally understand why you didn't put it in this story because you'll notice, Mark, that it it immediately turned me into my grandmother. I was like. What a pinata? What what is this? A uterus pinata. So yeah, it's not an easy thing to um before I let you go, uh on a completely different story. Um in St. Louis, more than twenty five hundred Boeing defense so called defense workers, I call them military aggression workers, threatening to go on strike contract. Uh, talks and no offense to the workers and their workers, they're working for a living, but contract uh, talks are stalling there. And this one hits close to home. They closed your, your, uh, one of your favorite spots to hang out while you were in Louisville. Talk about uh, people who provide uh, services necessary for one's health, uh, hangout center. So, uh, what's the latest with the machinists in uh Well, well the machinists had their, had their pension stripped from them, and now they're trying to strip the 401k contributions there. And there's a host of other issues. So, there's 2,500 Boeing workers that are threatening to go on strike. Could be a really big deal. Could be a really big movement, moment for the movement. Uh, so, that's happening there. Uh, and, um, you know, so that that's a pretty big deal. Uh, so, that's happening. Uh, and then, you know, uh, when we first started in Louisville, we'd hang out at this coffee shop called Heine Brothers in uh, the Highlands. The workers there unionized. They announced they were going to close the coffee shop, turn, turn it into a brewery that they technically own, and still sell coffee there, but also sell beer. So it seems like a scam, you know? Yeah, no, it's one of those uh, microbrewery type deals or whatever. Yeah. Well, there's also strike action happening right now. I think right near where I live, there's a place, there's a, micro, a small chain of uh, supermarkets called Moms. And um, yeah. and they, uh, I know their Baltimore store, most of them are right here in the D.C. area. They have a Baltimore store and they filed union actions, according to Max Alvarez at The Real News. I'm going to see if the ones around here like College Park are doing it also. If so, I'll go check it out. Um I shop there. We shop there for like fresh fruits and vegetables because they're great. Some of their stuff is a little pricey. It's like, you know, like a lot of organic health food stores, but, uh, but it's a nice place. Workers there are super nice as they usually are everywhere. If you talk to them. So, uh, you know, the more the merrier, as far as I'm concerned, the more the merrier, right? Yep. Exciting time, and we have to. And I think you know, going on the theme of the more the merrier, we have to have more ideas, more approaches, more strategies. Diversity of tactics is always important. Yep, yep. The struggle continues. So, as always, Mike Elk. It's paydayreport.com and uh, check it money, out, please. We need the money. I'll spend it on groceries, internet, something. <laughs> Get, uh, Mike needs the money, and when you give it to him, you will get good labor reporting, great labor reporting. And as always, thanks for great reporting, Mike, and as always, thanks for coming on the program. Thanks for having me on. Always a pleasure. And we'll be right back after this. I'm Richard R.J. Escal, and this is The Zero Hour. <laughs>